Hey there. All this talk about real-time technologies, I might give a different talk. Um, no, I'm joking. So yeah, my talk is on how to build front-end web apps at scale. Um, how I hope that relates to future JS is, is that we're moving even, you know, there's, there's already a trend of moving functionality to the browser, but we're going to be moving even more. So these applications are really going to need to scale. So this is a talk about, um, hopefully, a way of doing that in a way that we've achieved it. So yeah, as, as I'm Phil Legator of a company called Kaplan Systems. Um, so at Kaplan, we build web, well, we, we build software and tooling to help our customers build web trading platforms. So we build them, uh, and our customers build them as well using this tooling. And the um, part of that is, is building uh, large HTML5 front-end applications. Now at Kaplan, we've been doing that since. I mean, I joined them for the first time. This is my third attempt at Kaplan. They don't sack me. I just uh, keep coming back. Um, in 2001, we were building large front-end applications showing real-time data. But over the past few years, um, probably four years, um, these applications have become even more complex. They're, they're now real trading systems that run in the web browser. Uh, and achieving that is, is relatively difficult. So uh, a number of years ago, we, we got to a point where we experienced a whole lot of pain, uh, loads of problems. So we needed to come up with some concepts and practices um, in order to help us build these applications that really do scale. So we came up with those ideas, and then we, we built some tooling to help us support um, those development practices and concepts. And that's what Blade Runner JS is. Uh, it's an open source project that we've just open source, which is a kind of a rewrite of something we started about four years ago uh, that supports this workflow uh, developer tooling. And it has a very thin layer of JavaScript in there. So this, this talk isn't actually about Blade Runner JS. It's about the concepts, the ideas, um, and how hopefully you'll be able to take these ideas away and apply them to the tooling um, or, use them, or use Blade Runner JS if you want to. So we've got to define what a large scale front end or JavaScript application is. So Adi Osmani has already had a mention today. Uh, so we'll refer to him again. So we're talking about large-scale JavaScript apps or non-trivial apps running, uh, requiring significant developer effort to maintain. So they're going to require a lot of maintenance. They're big applications. That just makes sense. And then the browser is doing most of the work. So Addy talks about uh, data manipulation and display falling to the browser. The majority of the logic, um, the business logic, also runs in that browser. So that's a great starting point. So let's drill into that a bit more. We've got a large code base. So no matter how good a developer you are, the more functionality you add to an application, uh, the more code you're going to have. It just makes absolute sense. So in Kaplan Trader, we have an SDK, which we build our, our applications on top of. And as you can see, it's 1,000 um, JavaScript files, 131,000 lines of code, 95,000 uh, lines of test code. And then we build applications on top of that. And our customers build applications on top of that. And they're pretty big, too, at around 50,000 lines of code. In addition to all of this, there's, there's other asset types. So there's, there's templates. HTML templates, CSS, images, ITN, config, and so on. So this application has around a quarter of a million assets. So they're pretty big. Then there's complexity. So a, this front-end application will, will offer varying levels of complexity, You know, probably quite a complex, large application. So Gmail is the reference point for this, isn't it? Everyone goes, right, I want a single-page application, a large application. What do we look at? We look at Gmail. Because it offers a lot of functionality. We can, you know, we can search. We can label. We can. Um, uh, it's got that they've got their own categories. We can change to view our contacts. We've got options. We can compose a rich email. And I think that compose view is probably a, a really good example. We can search, you know, uh, contacts, write rich text, and so on. So this is an old version of Kaplan Trader. We're on Kaplan Trader two. This is Kaplan Trader three. But it, again, it's quite a complex front-end application. We've got layout management. We've got um, trade tiles. We've got charting. We've got things like uh, real-time news. Uh, we've got let me just the next thing. So this, I don't know, actually know what that is. Um, some sort of execution of trades. We've got large grids with thousands and thousands of rows of data in there, all communicating with a real-time back-end service. So both of these are you know, Gmail and Kaplan Trader, these large single-page applications offering complex functionality, as I've said. But I think the important thing is complex interactions. So the user, in, in order to achieve something with the application, has to interact with it in relatively complex ways that we can potentially make easier through, through applying UX practices. Um, but also the technology itself. So um, the components within that browser, within that, that, that web application, communicate with each other in relatively complex ways. And also, the components within the front end, 
interact with back-end services in, in complex ways. And these apps tend to stay open all day. Certainly Gmail does. I'm sure if anyone uses it, they have a tab open or, or running in its own um, window for most of the day. And it's the same with, with, with Kaplan Trader. So the things I'm going to talk about today are obviously based on this um, desktop replacement style app. But I think, it, although it probably won't, it's unlikely to be as applicable to web sites, there will be a range towards the, single, uh, the, the, the desktop replacement that it will be applicable to. So the next thing to think about is, is this application is going to be around for a while. So features will obviously change, new ones will be introduced, and old ones will be removed because as a, someone that's building a product, you have features that just no one's using, they're not offering the sort of value, it's not worth maintaining, you pull them out. And, and the important thing about that is to think about when you remove, or when you add new features, when you change them, or, or when you we remove them, it can't just break the entire, the rest of the application. The application still has to continue to function. Here's an example of progression in, in, in Gmail where the chat moved on. We, we introduced video. I didn't introduce video. Oh, no, they made video more accessible, and then it became Hangout. So just a simple uh, example. The final thing to consider in, in terms of what, what is a large-scale application is that there will be multiple contributors to this app. There's, there's a human factor to think about. Um, and the code base is going to be big. It's going to be around for a long time. So Kaplan Trader is, is code that's longer than, older than six years old, JavaScript that's older than six years. So the person that wrote that code might not even be there anymore. They certainly probably won't remember writing it. So you need to think about that. You also need to think about the different types of contributor. So there's going to be front-end developers, obviously. It's a front-end application. There's going to be back-end developers who maybe don't write code, but they'll at least define services that, that your application interacts with. And they'll more than likely be designers that change, um, you know, change HTML templates, CSS, add assets, images, and so on, and a number of other types of people. So these people might be on the same team, or they might be working across multiple teams within the same organization, or even potentially across multiple organizations. So we've got a professional services department with multiple teams in it. One of those teams might be working with a customer. That customer will have one or more teams. They might even outsource some of that development. So that's th potentially three organizations working on the same code base. So all I've really done is like come up with a bunch of questions that we need to try and answer. And we need to make sure this application is maintained and it's maintainable. So we've got this massive code base. How do we structure that? How do we maintain it? How do you create this? How do you have a, what's the application architecture in order to, to achieve this type of functionality that you want in your single page app? to allow for these interactions? How do you make sure that all these different types of contributors can, can do so in a, in a harmonious way? How do you ensure that you've got a quality application? That, you know, the more code you have, the more likely you're going to see benefits from tests. Some would say you should be testing from the start. I kind of agree. But, but at any point, you'll start to see benefit from tests definitely when you've got this large code base. Development has to be productive. You know, as a developers, we want to be focusing on building functionality. Um, so that, that experience has to be productive. And all of this needs to work together. So I'm going to go straight into the solutions. Um, I'm not going to go problem solution. I'm going to say, here's what we've done. Um, and then I'm going to hopefully go, here are the problems we came across originally. And here's why these solutions fit and work. So we're talking about front-end modular web applications. Now, I'm probably going to say components a million times, widgets once, um, modules a whole bunch of times. We call these blades because they're vertical slices of functionality in our, in our application. We've got a services layer. There's a lot of talk about microservices and so on at the minute. Hopefully, I can demonstrate why a services layer really works in, in front-end apps. MVStar goes without saying. I'll tell you which, which version we use and why, why it's so useful to us. You need efficient testing. So that's not just testing. It's testing that's reliable and runs quickly. And then we need to, tools to support this workflow to make sure, we, we, as developers, we are productive. So now it's my opportunity to, to prove it. Um, so I'll start by talking about what are components, modules, features, or blades. So I'll reference Gmail again, because it's a good, good example. So I've tried to break some of these things into features. Um, I spoke about some of it before. I particularly like the, the compose view, because you can search for contacts. You can compose a rich email. You can add attachments. You can reference things in Google Drive. You can send emails. So you can do all sorts of things from that. And it's a great vertical slice of functionality within Gmail. So that's what they are. What about the problems in terms of building these apps? So when you've got a big application, you have lots of assets. And finding them, something as simple as finding them can be difficult. So you're told to change the styling on a button in, in that composed view, maybe, or the behavior of handling a click 
in that send button. You can't just directly go into the assets folder and go, let me search in all the JavaScript for the right file um, or, or CSS. So what we've done and, and the approach that we suggest people take now is to group assets by, by feature. So you have a folder, which is your feature name. And within there, you have all the assets associated with that feature. It just makes sense. You, you might do that within your assets folder already, or you might have started doing this. But the great thing there is everything related to that feature is in there, including the tests. The next really, really simple thing, but which is actually quite important, is that when you run in the full application, um, it can actually take quite a while for things to reload. So if I'm the developer working on this chat functionality here, and I go, right, I've made a change in my code. I want to see how that's reflected in, in the UI. I then refresh the page, hopefully. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It was painful listening to me count that. So that's 10 seconds. By that time, I'm probably on TweetDeck, completely forgotten what I was doing, or I'm sending emails to people, or I'm doing something else. So just losing that context for 10 seconds every time you make a change is really important. So we want, to, we want to get that reload down as low as possible. The next thing is one of the pieces of pain is that, remember, we're, this is, again, Kaplan Trader. Um, but it could be, say, I'm working on, if it, if it were Gmail, I'm working on that compose view. Someone checks a change in that somehow gets through tests, somehow gets through continuous integration, and I pull it to my machine, and it breaks the entire application. I can't get on with what I'm doing anymore. Now, we have source control. We can revert these changes. But it's still a break in the flow of my day. So we want to avoid that, and especially if that's across multiple teams, multiple organizations. That time really builds up. So we want to avoid this. So from before, you remember that we're breaking applications into features. Here we've got a, a trade tile. That's one of our features. Now, we know that all those assets for that are located on disk together. So what we can do is we can take, use tooling to allow us to um, run that single feature on its own in isolation. We call these things workbenches. So that's really powerful. It lets me focus on building that single feature on its own, and I'm unaffected by changes that people make elsewhere in unshared code, in feature-related code. Obviously, if you're just refreshing that, it's a lot quicker than refreshing the whole application. So we've got this idea of, of these features, or the, the various other terms for it, and they're running in isolation. You need to bring them in together. So this is a very specific Blade Runner idea, but you can obviously take this idea of this individual thing and add it to an index.html page. Really, really simple. What you can also do is have multiple entry points into your application and then compose those features together to serve different purposes. So an example of desktop, tablet, and mobile is quite a good one, where we can have a very specific, rich composing view for desktop. But we have a search feature that's shared across all different aspects, all different types of um, access. You could even take this to a kind of login and permissioning level, where a certain user who's privileged get access, gets access to more features than, than a less privileged one, someone who's not paying money. So we've got these things together, but we haven't said how they communicate with each other. That's the next thing to think about. So this is where services come in. They provide access to these shared resources. A good example is inter-component inter communication. They do that through a service. That would be a messaging service. So we have an event hub in our architecture, a pub sub event hub that we can just communicate with generic messages between these, these components. Persistent service, it could, you could have a local service, uh, a local storage, or, or one that goes over the wire. Any sort of web API should be exposed via a service. And real-time services, so you know, it could be pusher, Firebase, uh, PubNub, Go Instant, or, or you've written your own service in Fay or Socket.io. And services shouldn't be implemented. They obviously be, will be an implementation, but when you access them, you should access them and think of them as a contract, a protocol, or an interface. And I know in JavaScript, some people don't like interfaces. Um, so just think of them as a contract. We do that anyway. We, we're, past, we're past something, and we know we can only interact with it in a certain way. This is just kind of a way of defining defining that. So we can have the implementation is, away, is hidden away from, from the actual contract that you're interacting with. So I haven't, I'm not going to show an example of defining one, but using them can be really simple. Because sometimes people go, oh, this sounds like, like a massive overhead. But you can achieve it with just a simple lookup. I mean, we have a service registry here. And all we do is we create an instance of the thing that we want. So we actually have a way of defining that that service provides a certain contract. But I'm not showing that here. And then we just use a string to uniquely identify that and say, right, this is the instance that anybody wants this chat.service, and they'll get that. So this is done at Bootstrap. Um, and then when anyone gets it, so within your feature, you want to start accessing chat functionality. 
you just call get service. It's really simple. So this is just this is an example of something that uh, Martin Fowler calls a dynamic service locator. There are loads of other ways to achieve this sort of thing. So hopefully now I can prove the, the value of this idea of services. So we go back to running our application, our full app. Now, when you've got a complex application, you've got a lot of dependencies in terms of back-end dependencies, real services that are probably running, um, authentication databases, real-time, or any sort of web API. Now, when you start, if you're starting on a project, you need to set all these up. So each of these things will probably have their own specific runtime, maybe. They might have their own configuration. People make mistakes. You know, we make mistakes when we set these sorts of things up. There are ways to automate this, which is great. Um, and then all those things need to be running before we can get our app running. But if you remember, we're now building our features in isolation. So we don't need all of those services running anymore. We just need the service related to the feature that we're building. So login only requires authentication. If we've got some sort of latest news feature, we only need our real-time service running. But even better than that, because we've got this services layer, at bootstrap time, we can go, hang on a minute, I don't really want that, that real service running. I can ins insert a fake service that I interact with, something that I write in JavaScript and I maintain, and that helps me do the development. Now, a good example of why this is useful is that if you work across multiple teams, one team is actually writing the back-end component. They're not going to get it done for another two months. You need to start development now and building your functionality. You can do that. You have a conversation up front. You decide what the contract is. That might change. You can go back and forward over time to change your um, implementation of this service. But you can create that fake service and start building functionality now. So a quick overview of why to use services. Um, so f remember, we're saying features can come can, and can go and can change. So they can't directly reference each other. Because if they rely directly on uh, an, another feature, then when you remove that other feature, your application will break. So you do all communication through services. As I said, you can easily change that implementation. My example was that we have a fake one. But it could be that in the future, a, a better implementation. You can think of a better implementation. You can do that on the side, and then as soon as you're happy with that, you push that into production and just replace the existing one that's there. And so one of the things that I think is really great about this is that for different types of runtime, you can add to these different services. So we've got this idea of a workbench, which is like your developer mode. Um, there's obviously test, and then there's the application. So I'll provide some examples of that. So this is, again, this workbench idea. Now what we've got is we've got this Price's uh, workbench tool, is what we call them, is actually pretending to be the real-time service. So this means we don't actually need our real-time service running. It means when we're offline, sitting on the train, on a plane, we can still do work and make this, this guy over here push data through, pretend to be that real-time service. And then we see that reflected in our UI. Over here, we've got an idea of uh, state, so the trade's executing. What does my UI look like when I'm in a certain state? So you can click a button over here, it updates the service, fires an event, and we can make sure that our functionality is working as expected over there. So as developers, there's, there's, a, there's a big thing at the minute about micro-tooling. We like to write our own grunt tasks is probably the best idea. The problem with that is it's all about file concatenation, compilation. What I like about this is that we're writing, we're writing tooling to enable us to build features within our applications. The other thing about services is that I mean, most of you are probably sitting going, this really helps testing. And it obviously does. And that's one of the, the main driving factors behind this. Um, so at, at test time, we can add our, use our fake services that we've used in our workbenches to, to pretend to behave in certain ways, to deal with edge cases that setting up on a, on a real back-end service would be a complete pain. Or we can add mocks and then um, execute some code in our business logic and, and ensure that it interacts with the service as we expect. And then in real runtime, we add the real services in. So the next thing to talk about is, is this efficient testing. Um, so I haven't, I've missed out MV star right now, but that's because it falls into this. In the same way that services really help testing, so does MV star. Let's quickly go back to services and just go, I've talked about how this is so, so beneficial already. Um, it also means that, so what we used to do is we used to have a whole bunch of back-end services and the front-end uh, app, and we used to use Selenium and WebDriver. So we'd have to reset our back-end services, launch a browser, execute a test. When that test completes, close the browser, restart the back-end services, launch the browser, execute the test again. There's so many things that can fall over there that our testing was so unreliable. Um, you know, we still got things out, but it just took far too many runs to, to make it worthwhile. There was a much better way of doing that. So again, with the service registry, we get the value of using these fake services. The next thing is, 
the DOM. So we, when we write tests, we tend, as much as possible, we tend to miss out I.O. You know, we don't want to make calls over the wire. We don't want disk access. We treat DOM in the, the DOM in the same way. You're, you're kind of jumping across runtimes. You're, you, you're into the browser, um, which is dealing with rendering. And again, what we found was doing these Selenium-based tests that we'd make assumptions about the DOM, things being ready, and they weren't. And it made our tests highly un unreliable. So now we do about 10% tests at Selenium level with a full app. There's like a smoke test to make sure everything's working. And we do the rest of our tests entirely in code, trying to miss any sort of I.O., any sort of cross-boundary execution. So this is where MVVM has come in for us. So we use Knockout, um, although in terms of the tooling, we can use kind of any library we we'll want, and we're spiking um, ideas around that right now. And it sounds like React might be a really good example of, of something you could use here, too, because of its virtual DOM. Um, so we have a view model. And the view model is a logical representation of the state of the view. And we rely on Knockout to do its job. And when we update that view model, we know that it will um, deal with the re-rendering of the view. So we do all, test, all our tests at that view model level, with the, with the exception of, of these, the smoke tests. And it also means that when we've got this domain model, we can take that logical functionality and share it across multiple views. So this is the big win for us. This has been a massive win. That We've got services. We've got this view model. This is our feature. So we can test our entire feature in isolation without any back-end services running, without interacting with the DOM. Um, and we get a lot, lot better coverage in this way and much more reliable testing. So our testing, there used to be a, um, an example of this where we had a significant number of these application end-to-end -end tests, whereas now we've got a chunk of unit tests that test class-level stuff. We've got Blade functional tests, which test our full feature in isolation. Then the smoke tests, then some manual tests. And this, you know, this proves how beneficial it's been to us. I don't know if anyone's in this sort of situation. But it used to take eight hours overnight for our tests to execute. And as I said, they were just highly unreliable because there were too many moving parts. Um, so now we can execute the same number of tests, probably better coverage, in less than 30 minutes on my machine, for example. Um, but even better than that, because we've got this architecture in place, because we've got this way of building our, uh, our functionality in isolation, we can actually just run the tests against our feature. We know that by adding a feature, removing a feature, changing a feature, it won't have an impact on the other features. So we're safe to do that and check in. So the final thing to think about is the tooling that supported this and, and what you can do. So the focus is developer workflow and building features. So here's an example of a workflow. When we want to start a new, uh, a new project, we want a skeleton, you know, create a, a scaffolding of the application. You know, we've seen this sort of stuff with Yeoman. We know the value of that. Then we go, right, I'm going to build a feature. So I'm going to scaffold that out. With that, we know that all our ass assets like, related to that feature are on disk together. So we can go around building our feature, maybe writing a test first and building our feature, then running that thing in isolation in this idea of a workbench. Again, you know, we've, as developers, we've done that occasionally. We've built a little feature, gone, I don't want to run it in the full app. We do that. It's great because we get to play with it and see how it works, see how, how we can interact with it. Then we go, right, OK, are we happy with that? Feature complete or not, we can iterate. And then at that point, we do that composition. We take those, those features and we put them into, the, into the, the application. Now, in the workshop we did a couple of days ago, we found that's the point at which you start to see little errors creeping in. But generally, if you define services properly and you understand how these things work in, you can actually get to the point where multiple teams can put these features into to, uh, to this, you know, in your index.html page, and they will just work because you've defined that contract, those ways of these things functioning. And then we can go through the standard build deploy process and then start creating new features again. So let's look at what, what the tooling offers here. So it just makes sense, you know, the point in, in all this tooling we've got at the minute is we identify things that we repeat and they're a pain and we automate them. So we've got this defined workflow and what the tooling can do is it defines, it understands that workflow and helps you achieve that. And the good thing about that is it promotes consistency. It means that all our applications, no matter who's working on them, if they've used this tooling before and they know how we build applications, they know where to find assets and they know the workflow to generally follow. Scaffolding is an obvious idea, you know, dev server, uh, builds and bundling, um, and running tests. And anything that you can kind of think of that you generally do quite frequently. That's just common sense. The next thing is intelligence. And um, we're starting to see some tooling that's coming around offering this sort of thing. Um, and what I mean by that is, I think I'm missing a slide. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> Coming to that. <laughs> um, so our tooling needs to be intelligent. It needs to understand how we work, and it needs to support that. So it needs to understand application structure 
and, and the concepts. That's really important. So here's Ed 209. Um, I've got longer than 30 seconds to comply, hopefully. So what we mean by that is we don't really want to be forcing anything on developers, but to achieve that level of consistency, to make sure that we do things in the same way, to make sure that these things are really maintainable, we do need to make sure that we, we generally do things in the same way, or we're doing things up to, up to spec. So things like integrating JS Hint into your tooling, um, or a, a general, going back to the intelligence point, an understanding of how you structure applications. So we've said that these features shouldn't be aware of each other. So if one of our features tries to reference code in another feature, our tooling actually detects that and says, hang on a minute, you can't do that, and we'll just fail. So this is an, another really good example of, of um, and the intelligent tooling. So it actually, uh, our tooling, and we're starting to see some other things like this as well, something called Asset Graph I saw recently. Um, it understands how we structure our applications. So it understands the relationships between our assets. It understands the idea of, in our case, blades or features. And it understands that from our entry point, we can require access to that. We say, we're going we're gonna to use this feature. So we can work out the dependencies for our application. It can work out the CSS that it's going to bundle. It can work out the JavaScript that's going to be bundled, the, the HTML templates. It can go even deeper than that, because we write JavaScript in a certain way. We use, um, we've got our own kind of browserify style um, functionality. It can analyze, analyze those requires and work out which JavaScript is actually being used. So only the files that are referenced are actually bundled. So this is this idea of intelligent builds or bundling. So, and also at different levels. Um, knowledge of these runtimes. So at, when we build our bundle for the workbench scenario, well, actually, we can serve files individually. But if you say, let's look at the application level, it, if it's aware of how services are configured, it can, take, it can go, right, I can see that a service is being referenced here. This is the application uh, runtime. I'm creating my deployable asset. I'm going to bundle in the real services, not the fake ones that you've been using during development. And then customization. As I said, we, we, we want to lock down to a certain extent exactly what you can do, but you need to identify the points in that workflow that you want to extend and change. You know, different requirements will come along. Um, so the, the obvious thing is, you know, we're talking about wanting to do automation, so you need to be able to easily add commands. Um, you want to be able to um, change builds and bundling. So we, we used to use um, a namespace style JavaScript. It wasn't too great but it helped us identify what, exactly what was being used. We wanted to move to a better way of developing, so we wanted to use the require style sync syntax that's used in CommonJS or, or Node. So our bundling actually understands that, lets us build those dependencies. So we've identified that the way that we code might change and the language that we use might change. So it might be that if we want to move to CoffeeScript or we want to move to, to ES6 now, or we want to use TypeScript, that we can change that bundling process, you know, plug in those things in. Um, and also test runner. We used JS test driver at the minute. It's a bit flaky sometimes, the development process, uh, the, the, the testing experience isn't quite right, but we've identified that as something that we want to change. So that's a plug-in, that's a, a point in the workflow that you can augment. So hopefully, I've now kind of proven, if we go back to those, those initial kind of questions or points that I said, how do you structure this massive code base? We've done it through feature and it's worked really well. Um, what's the architecture for this functionality in these types of interactions? Services and MVVM are really the core, core things in there. It lets us build each side of our, each side of our feature. Um, have I missed another slide? No. Did I talk about that one? Yeah, okay. Good. So, the, well, going back to that. So that's, that's been the real winner, as I said. Um, poking the view model and seeing what interactions were with the services, using the services, and seeing how that's reflected in the view model, the state of that. Um, View. Promoting quality and oh no, contrib uh, um, contribute to harmony. So we're separating concerns. We've got our assets separated. We've got our, our features all together. Um, our code base is, as I said, structured in that way. We've got uh, modules and components in this architecture, which, which naturally um, promotes loose coupling. Um, we're promoting quality. The decision to use services and the decision to use MVVM was, you know, was, was massively pushed by this idea that we, we, need, we need to be writing lots of tests. This, this application needs to be of high quality. And we need this productive experience. So we had to write tooling to support this workflow. Um, it would have been great if Node was around when we started this um, four years ago. It's around now, but unfortunately, some of our larger customers still won't allow it. So we've, we've written our tooling in Java, but we're looking at ways of you know, um, using, being able to execute JavaScript within 
the JVM. So we might be able to take uh, advantage of some of this tooling. Um, and they all need to be complementary. And you'll see from the reference points here that I'm saying um, feature, MVVM, services, architecture, which is obviously services and MVVM, um, the, this idea of features, services and MVVM again, that they are all complementary and they're letting us achieve each of these things. So that's it. Hopefully that's given you a better idea of how we do it and hopefully a way that you can potentially take some of these ideas and, and use them in your applications. So thank you. So my question is, um, if, you are using, if you are testing uh, using fake services and you are replacing the real REST API with your fake service, uh, you need some test data like JSONs that will be used in your tests. And in my experience, this was uh, very painful to maintain because API changes from time to time and you have to remember to, to update those uh, JSON fixtures. And basically, I don't have any good tools. So I wanted to ask, what's your approach to this, and how do you maintain it? I think it is painful. I think um, you know it's a large application, multiple teams working on it. There, there just needs to be these points of, if that's going to change, you need to have a discussion. You need to sit down in a room, work it out, um, and come up with that JSON payload so that you've got some fake data. I don't think there's a, I mean, there are some solutions. You know, Wizzle, um a while back, tied to SOAP was actually quite a good way of ensuring that you had that conversation, you could generate data. Um, I think Google have got something kind of similar in terms of API definition, some of the stuff that they're doing. You might be able to use something that helped you with that sort of thing, but I don't think it's a, I don't think there's a silver bullet for that. Do you have any tool to get those fixtures? For example, somebody already implemented the API and you are starting to work on front end. Do you have any tool to, to generate those fixtures or do you do it manually? Uh, not, so a lot of our interactions is with real-time services, so we've got a, a real-time component. Um, we do have tooling around generating fake real-time updates, loads of stuff like that. We've actually got back-end services if we want to do, if we, if we really do want to do cross-boundary testing. Um, but that's all proprietary to our, uh, our protocol in terms of our, our protocol, RTTP, real-time text protocol. So nothing that's generically um, JSON REST API responses. So. There's a second question at the back over there. Um, so you talked about uh, services and these blades. And I was just wondering if you have some data um, that's shared be between the different blades, whose responsibility is to initiate fetching of that data? Is it, is it the blades fetch their data, or do, does, do the services do it, or is there something else, like a router, perhaps? Or? Uh, so we don't really have routing in our in our, in our app. Um, it's it's an interesting question because it depends kind of you know upon initialization. So in the workshop that we did, we made sure that the services had kind of a, a, a method on it that said, if you want initial state, you request it from me. Um, so, and then your implementation of that service really depends. You know, it can cache if, if a similar request comes in, a similar call, you can cache. So. It's like anything in software, isn't it? It really depends on how you implement it. It's entirely up to you. This is just a mechanism for exposing those services. And if you, whichever way you want to do it really is up to you. But I would say that it's normally, in the example that I did, it was the call to the service. So the, 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 the feature said when it was ready and when it's ready for that initial payload. Great. Thanks, Phil. That's great. Round of applause. Thank okay. you. Thank you.